But welcome to the first session of our Pick and Mix session for Ag Innovation 2022. I'm your local farmer councillor, Fee Dalgetty, and my husband does most of the farming in our household on the fringe of Hunterville. We've got 40 minutes uh, now until 11.55, all going well, um, which includes some time for questions. So make sure you use your Sligo. And I'll give Gerald a 10 minute warning. So I'd like to welcome our speaker, Gerald Hickey from First Light Farms. Gerald established First Light Farms in 2004 to meet a global market need for differentiated premium added value meats. He has 25 years management and governance experience in the meat industry, creating and directing niche export opportunities. Gerald has a unique and comprehensive understanding of the full red meat value chain from genetics, farming and branded sales through to the consumer. In First Light Foods, their value chains involve ethnically, ethnically produced venison and grass-fed Wagyu beef, with the latter earning significant endorsement both domestically and internationally. Gerald will present First Light Farms optimising the value chain. Tēnā koutou katoa, ko Bukitapu, te monga, ko te arai te awa, ko rongawhakata te iwi, ko manatoke te marae, ko Gerard Hickey ahu. Tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou katoa. I think my job after those couple of great speakers from Andrew and Serene is to try and give some relativity back to the industry that we all work for. And so the first thing I want to do is just get a full understanding for who I'm talking to in the audience here. So first of all, we've got an Ag Innovation Conference. I'm assuming we've got some entrepreneurs, some innovators, some budding innovators in the audience. So can you put your hand up? Who's in that category? Got at least one or two, and I think there's a few more I recognise as well. Who is a fast follower? Who wants to watch what happens and then nip in as quickly as it looks like it's going to be a success? Okay. And the rest are followers, right? Well, First Light Foods is an example of an early adopter. It's 18 years on now. But I'm going to tell you a little bit about our story. But ultimately, what I'd like you to do today is from a conference such as today, I think you should aim to have a few notes and a bit of paper, one bit of paper, a few take-home notes. I want to try and give you one sentence for that one bit of paper so that you take from this talk. So initially, my talk was going to be called Optimising the Value Chain. It still is. But as I prepared it yesterday, sorry, last week, um, I decided to change its name to Adapting to Change. So a little bit about First Light, first of all. Um, as you can read there, and if those who, who aren't aware of us already, is we're a premium end of the meat business, very much wanting to be at the top end. Um, we want to work with New Zealand's best farmers, link them with the best global consumers. We're what they call an integrated value chain, which means we stretch from genetics all the way through to the consumer and everything in between. We've got a roughly $100 million turnover, which for our industry is relatively small, but we've got 400 farmers suppliers uh, stretched from Northland to Southland and 50 staff. And you can see our, our values there, but number two is really what I'm talking about today, which is innovation. We heard Sir Tim, Sir Ian, sorry, talk about the why. What gets us up in the morning? What gets us active and involved in what we're doing? So when we set up First Light 18 years ago, this was our purpose, and our purpose remains here today, which is not necessarily to make money, not to please a group of farmers. It was to lead by example. 
to basically create change in our sector and our industry, and that's what gets us going every day. So ultimately, First Light exists because we wish to lead. We wish to lead in our sector, lead by example, and we then break that down into saying, let's show the world how to produce beautiful meat, premium meat, the right way. But it's all about leadership. So that's our why. And you've heard us talk about a value chain, so this is our value chain, and we would probably amend it a little bit today. But essentially, we start with a, with a breeder. That could be an Angus breeder. Um, it could be uh, a dairy breeder. And I've focused today on our beef side of our business rather than our venison side, given it's a, a beef and lamb activity. From the, uh, the breeder, we then have a arrera. It might be on the cow. It might be in the shed. We then have a backgrounder who takes that wiener through to roughly 18 months of age. A finisher who takes that 18-month animal through and finishes it. We then have a processor. In our case, we toll process through uh, Greenlee and Ansco in North and South. We then have a distributor who takes that product, whether it be around the world or um, down Queen Street in Auckland, to a retailer or restaurant and to ultimately the consumer. So that's the value chain we operate in. You've heard about supply chains. A supply chain is, to me, how you produce a product, which you then worry about selling. A value chain is how do we make a product with the consumer in mind for that consumer's needs. Today, where it says consumer, I'd break that into the home consumer, I'd break that into the restaurant consumer, and I'd break that into the, the retail consumer. So that's the value chain. Of course, the reason I'm here today is because we've all seen some change. And very briefly, for our sector, for the meat sector, there's been five key changes that I've seen in here. So the first one is, as you're probably aware, freight and shipping shortages. So it's been impossible at times, even as recently as this week, to physically get containers, get shipping space, and get your product around the world. Just can't get them because they're all utilized around the world. Many are currently offshore in China. So the next recent change is as well as not being able to get the, the, the shipping space, the price has literally doubled. Um, so what may have cost us before roughly three to four thousand dollars US to get to across the world, I think eight to ten. And when we complain to the shipping companies about this, the first response is, well, I can't give you any, any space anyway. And the second one is everyone else is paying double what you're paying. So across the world, the Americans, the Chinese are paying double that. The third one, of course, is that there's been disruptions in processing. So COVID-driven and labor force migration and everything else that's gone on with it, there's been labor shortages, there's been processing shortages across our sector, which continue today. So it's been very difficult to get your, your stock processed. We've all heard about the government regulations which are coming at us, which we're having to work our way through. Um, and during all this has been happening, we've seen this extreme volatility in commodity markets, rises and falls, whether it be in the meat sector, whether it be in the, the fossil fuel sector, some extreme volatility. So again, coming back to what I'm talking about today, which was what have we done to adapt to change? And this is where I hope there's a, a take home for yourself. So there's three things that we've done over the last 18 months to adapt to those changes that are coming here. So the first thing we've done is we've focused on our customer even further. So we knew our customer pretty well, but now we know them acutely. We know exactly who they are and what's important to them and what's, what they're going to make their purchase decisions on and what they're actually looking for as a future product. The second thing we've done is we've, we've added product values. We've, we've looked at the range of products we've produced and said, what is, now that we understand our consumer better, what is it that we can produce for them? And where can we create more value for them and more value for us and our suppliers? And then thirdly, we've said, well, let's take what we now learn and drive efficiencies through our business based on doing things better, less wasted, cheaper. So I'm going to talk to you about our customer. So in our case, sorry, that same problem. We've taken what we considered to be our US consumers 
and we've now break them down into what we consider to be five groups. And you'll see that the green arrow at the bottom says that on the left, they are of lower value to us, but still important. And on the right hand side is where we see the consumers being of highest value to us. So let's go through each of these. And again, the message I'm trying to give you here is that we've done the work, we've followed these people home, we've done the exercise to truly and actively understand what our consumers are, so therefore we can cater to their needs. So number one consumer group is our barbecue boys. They quite often take a bit of um, attention, attention grabbing. They're blokes. They are barbecue focused, obsessed in fact. They're not health focused. Uh, they'll drive a big pickup truck. So we are talking a US consumer here, but maybe we're talking about this in the North as well. Um, so they are big on their Traegers, best possible barbecue, and they'll spend the money on the smoking gear that goes with it. So slow cooking movement, it's all about red meat. They, um, they're always researching online. They belong to Facebook groups of other barbecue fanatics. Um, they go to events around Texas and other parts of the US, all about barbecuing and smoking. They love watching sports events. It goes with the barbecuing and the smoking. Um, they have this, they get this feel good, the social equity of discovering something new and sharing it with a photograph and with a story online to the other barbecue users. They come from small town, example, California, Texas. Um, and they sort of understand the grass fed thing, but ultimately they're a big US local grain fed beef buyer. So I'm gonna read you a couple of lines here. So Chad, Chad is 45 years of age. He's married to Brittany. They've got three kids. They live in Texas. Monday to Friday, he's a sales rep for an engineering company, but at the weekend, he is king of his barbecue. Chad loves barbecuing. Whether it's grilling or smoking, it's his life. He's obsessed with perfecting the perfect recipe. He likes big cuts of meat. Smoking as a brisket is his happy place. He follows other meat-obsessed barbecue people on social media will listen to their thoughts and techniques, but will always add his own spin to it. He believes that grain-fed beef tastes better than grass-fed, but it's always interesting to try new things and occasionally experiment with grass-fed. But usually that's because some other meat-mad person has recommended it and he goes back to grain-fed. He's a passionate American, so prefers to buy American beef, but can be persuaded if a superior tasting product is on special or online. So that's our first Consumer group, barbecue boys. So let's move on to healthy lifers. So what we know about this consumer is that they can be of mixed age, but typically they are females. As it says there, they love the healthy food trends. They follow the diets, the raw diets, the new superfoods. The food is a medicine for them, because you are what you eat. They love to eat vegetarian and vegan food, but they still eat meat in their diet because of the health implication with that. They're an animal lover. Uh, food claims, i.e. antibiotic free, GMO free, grass fed are important. They believe in climate change. Social media is huge for them and they're always taking pictures of their beautiful food and they are ultimately wellness warriors where it's all about food, fitness and meditation. Okay, Ashley, she lives in Manhattan. She's married to Harrison. They don't have any children yet. They both work as lawyers. Ashley also has a very active social media account, which she eventually would like to do after law is finished. She loves to be able to share her passion for wellness, and of course food is at the top of that list. She enjoys yoga, her Peloton bike, and meditation. At the weekend, Ashley and Harrison enjoy trying out new cafes for brunch. She has lots of food knowledge through her extensive reading and research. Ashley eats mainly a vegetarian diet, but she also likes to listen to her body. And sometimes when she is low in energy, she knows she needs an iron boost, she will buy grass-fed beef because it's the best for her. That's Ashley. Let's move on to a uh, third group of, of customers, consumers, fitness followers. So younger, uh, no kids, very much fitness focused and sustainability saving the world focused. 
They make decisions based on recommendations from people they trust. Uh, they're all about clean protein. So it's all again about nutrition, fitness, clean. And so clean is grass-fed, clean is antibiotic-free. They eat a whole food diet. They see things such as the paleo, keto, gluten-free as healthy choices. And they are very social media savvy, particularly Instagram. So Dan, on the left, is 27 years of age. He works in software development and lives in an apartment with his girlfriend, Katie, on the right, near Santa Monica in LA. Dan loves his life. He's a great job and a recent promotion. He is now starting to earn a bit more money. Dan and Katie love working out because it's a huge part of their life. Every night after work, Dan heads to F45 for a workout. He loves F45. He just can't imagine life without it. From the trainers of F45, he has learned a lot more about what he should eat. Although he doesn't like to label his food choices, his way of eating follows some of the paleo and keto principles. High, clean protein diet being the most important, and then he then balances that with carbs and fats. He never felt or looked better. His trainer at F45 has told him to keep it simple. Just eat real foods, lots of organic veggies and fruit, plus grass-fed meats. Free-range chicken and wild-caught fish. They normally shop every day, of the week, usually on their way home from F45. When it comes to buying beef, grass-fed is important because they also are more price sensitive, but choose organic grain-fed because they're confused from time to time. They know that a steak with a salad on the side is the perfect meal for them and their lifestyle. So that is Dan and Katie. The fourth group of consumers that we now understand is our weekend warrior. Remembering as we're going on, we're adding more and more value to the business and to our, to our consumers and to our business from these type of consumers. So Weekend Warrior, he's a bloke. Uh, he's 45 plus. He has a high disposable income. He likes to eat nice food and drink good wine and he buys the best of everything can he can, as he can afford it. He either hosts dinner parties or he eats out regularly at top restaurants. He likes the product story largely so he can repeat it to his mates at his dinner parties. So the story of where the product comes from and how it's grown. He's well-traveled. He enjoys food documentaries on Netflix in his spare time. He does go on Facebook, but he's actually not a big social media user. And he shops at top-end stores such as Bristol Foods and high-end butcheries. So that's Rob. The barbecue. He's 55. He's married to Carol. Rob has run a successful consultancy business in Seattle for the last 20 years. They've got three kids, but they're all off to college. In the last couple of years, Rob has started to take a bit more interest in his health, mainly because Carol has pointed out that he needs to lose a few pounds. Rob and Carol are trying to do a bit more exercise. They go for evening walks. They go to their favourite coffee place along the way. Rob prides himself on his food knowledge and loves to eat the best, most delicious food. If they're not going out to one of their favourite restaurants, they'll entertain at home. Rob believes his, he cooks the best steak and it's always his go-to choice when entertaining that he'll ask all of his guests how they like their steak and he will cook it perfectly for them. Rob will buy the best tasting grass-fed meat he can. He loves to be the host and he likes to be able to talk in detail about where his food comes from. So that's Rob. Our last group and our most valuable group are our informed nutritionist. As you can see there, they're female. They are 35 plus with children. They also have high disposable income. They exercise regularly. They like to eat healthy and cook nutritious meals for their family because it's all about their family. They buy lots of cookbooks, they hunt for recipes online, they shop at more middle of the road, but still top end retailers, but they also go to the, farm, the local farmers markets. Attribute claims, GMO, antibiotic free, are important, grass fed. They spend a lot of time on social media, Instagram, Facebook, and blogs, and they like to influence her friends and connections with their knowledge on food and health. But ultimately she's buying for her family. So Vanessa is mum to two kids. She works part-time in between the kids' school as an HR consultant. She's married to Rick, who runs a PR company. 
They live in Marin and San Francisco Bay area, and they love the beach lifestyle. Vanessa exercises to look, look, look good, a mixture of looking good and also running in Pilates. Vanessa follows a lot of different people on social media, a lot of celebrities, nutritionists, and fitness experts. Vanessa is quite obsessed with what she and her family eats, and she understands nutrition is extremely important, because not only because it makes her look good, but also the health of her family. When it comes to buying beef, Vanessa knows that grass-fed is simply the best. She buys a lot of ground beef and hot dogs for the kids, but also she purchases steaks for her and Rick regularly, as Rick loves steak, and it's his absolute favourite, and Vanessa knows it's a great way to get protein and nutrition into the family. She generally chooses a ribeye for Rick and a fillet for herself. So, to the extreme, I know, but this is what we've done to really truly understand our customers, and we now know where we need to cater our business as we've fine-tuned it to say where can we get the best bang for buck. So focused on our customer, we've targeted the customers that add the most value to our business. We've prioritized those customers by their fit and their likelihood to stay with us and be loyal with us. Uh, and we've also prioritized those customers that we now understand will extend their product purchases as we grow our product range. So key point is we have focused on our customers. So the second thing we've done is armed with information as we said, right, what can we do to add product value? What can we do to actually have more products to sell to our target customers and also generate some more uh, higher returns for us and our farmers? So that's where our product range has been for the last, uh, up to the last 18 months, and it's still there, but there's a couple of key projects now underway within the business. So the first one is a whole carcass optimization project and we call it in the industry of the fifth quarter, so it's the non-meat part of, of the animal. So just this year, for instance, we've launched hair on hides. Uh, we're launching micronutrients as we speak, which is uh, whether it be liver pool, pills um, and, and, and the likes, powders, collagens in August, and then pet food and treats later in the year. And we're doing that leveraging off the existing attributes that our our target customers and consumers already know about, whether it be the 100% grass fed, the traceable, the antibiotic free, the GMO free, or the certified humane welfare. So what we now know is that there's significant added value potential in these products. So when a hide is worth $30, a hair on a hide is worth $1,000, even after costs, that's the sort of margins that, that are available. Uh, pet foods and pet food treats $100 per head, and nutraceuticals, um, about $300 per animal. So we're talking some reasonably big margins, added value margins that are possible, because we now understand our customer, our consumers, what drives them, what they're looking for beyond the stake. Similarly, understanding our customer, we've said, what other products are they looking for beyond the fifth quarter? And what we've learned is that there are parts of the, of our, our product range, um, that we can add some more value, either using the trimmings or using the secondary cuts. So just in this last year, we've now producing and launched uh, pastramis, so smoked and cured goods, and obviously burgers on the right, and we've now into the retail snack bars. So whether they be um, lasagnas, whether they be um, uh, wraps and the, and the like, so a whole range of new products, cooked products going into the marketplace. So similarly, uh, yeah, lasagnas, cooked products, sandwich meats, and you can see again the extent of money that's available as we take what is a commodity product um, of a trimming or a secondary cut, so like super brisket, and create a new range. So on the left and the right hand side of that screen there, you can see two new products that have been launched in the New Zealand market um, as we speak. One is a, uh, a Wagyu beef cheek, and on the right hand side is a, is a venison ragu. So this is the New Zealand market, but also the US. So the second thing we've done in the, in, to adapt to the change is we've added product value. So we've increased the product range for our customers through range extension, knowing what our customers are looking for and will pay for and want to trend towards. 
We've then added value per animal by utilising the fifth quarter and the trimmings and secondary cuts to add some more value on a per animal basis. So the third thing we've done is we've having understood our customer and having expanded the product range is we've then looked to drive the efficiencies of the value chain. So the first thing we've focused on is our cost to serve. So what we now know and what all makes sense, of course, is that repeat business costs less. Not only does it cost less for physically getting it to the consumer, but we don't need to promote as much because the customer already knows who we are. So five to eight percent promotional cost of revenue um, can be half that amount when the customers know who we are. Um, and the sales and marketing cost to get to those customers is less and is the account management. So cost of serve is less. The planning horizon um, needs to be longer in the current situation. So a longer term planning means that we can reduce costs through improved logistics. So it's hard to get those containers, it's hard to get the shipping space. So it's important that we, we have a plan that we can go to the shipping companies with and fill. Um, more reliable processing and freight bookings and of course just reduce costs of transactions. So a longer planning horizon has given us the ability to get slots and space, whether that be processing space or shipping space that others haven't got because they're doing it just in time. And the other thing we've done is we've, we've chosen to right size our business. So you can say that that is, you question, is this an opportunity, but we've said this is the right time to actually right size. So this is the time whereby we can shift. So in our beef business, we've said 20,000 cattle was the right size. We can balance supply and demand. We can focus uh, on value as opposed to volume. We can incentivize numbers of cattle per supply and incentivize supplier commitment. So it seems the right time to right-size the business. And then we've also gone to our supply base to, and to encourage a move towards more specialisation as opposed to generalisation, which is all about performance and all about margin per stage. So just to summarise those again, so the drive efficiency, we're aiming to reduce cost to serve. We've asked and extended the planning horizon. We're right-sizing the business and we're incentivizing supply specialization. But all of these efficiency gains can only happen once we understand our customer and add product range. So that's the whole list all together. Uh, all the things we've done to adapt to change over the last 80 months. I suppose this, having seen that, what can you do in the audience? And I think there's there's a couple of things you, you could look at this, and maybe this works into what Andrew was saying earlier on, is, is we can simply just look at the third of those three things we talked about there and focus on efficiencies and tighten our belt. But I'd encourage the innovators and early adopters in the room to consider changing your business model. Innovation comes from early adoption, decommoditization, and collaboration. And that's what First Light has done and continues to do. And I think that's a, a change of business model that I'd encourage you to consider, consider now, and it's a good time to do so. Thank you. <laughs> How are we for time? Any questions? Are there any questions?
So I think that the, the meat industry, for all the good bits that it is, and, and we recognise a lot of collaboration partners, it is a supply chain. So unless you choose actively to join a value chain, whether that be um, the Lumina lamb, the Alliance's lamb, whether it be um, New Zealand Merino, whether it be Atkin Sheep Ranch, there's a whole number of them out there where you're connecting yourself to a consumer, then you're not part of a value chain. You're part of a supply chain. Supply chains are good, commodity market strong, but you are, you are a price taker, not a price maker. But it's an active choice to say, do I want to be connected to the consumer or do I not? And probably 95% of people want to be just part of a supply chain. So I think it's an active choice to move away from that. And the key will be you understand the consumer. You know the consumer. Cheryl, one more here. Um, how does what First Light is doing fit into Beef and, Beef and Lamb's Taste Pure Nature program in the US? Good question. Uh, um, so there are, there are layers in the market of, of marketing collateral and of branding that the consumers are looking for. So we appreciate the Taste Pure Nature as, as the New Zealand layer. It's basically telling the US consumer, if that's where we are, that this is a product of New Zealand and it's going to be good. And then on top of that, we have the first light layers and we have the Wagyu layers and the rest of it. So it's, a, it's an important base upon which every company can work off. It's, it basically gives us the New Zealand stamp. Awesome. Um, so one more. Do you see an opportunity to expand into other markets and countries? And what are the barriers you face? The world's huge. Um, so as an example, we've chosen West Coast US. We're in uh, three West Coast states in Texas. There's 65% of our sales in New Zealand is our other key market. Um, we're not in China at all. So there's, there's, you just think of the other global markets that are out there. The key thing is narrowing it down, very much like Sir Ian's presentation, narrow it down from a, a region to a country to a city to a group of consumers, and that's what a value chain is all about. So definitely. Awesome. Thank you, Gerald, very much. Uh, um, number of insights there, especially for a nervous mother whose daughter is about to go into market in the States. So, um, yeah, lots to think about.